Yosemite Discovered by Marie Sontag Chapter 1 Big Oak Flat, California Gold Country, April 10, 1849 Daniel awoke to air that stung his eyes and clawed his throat. The smoke-filled room muddled his thoughts. I've got to get Ma and Pa out of the house. He threw off his woolen blanket and scrambled out of the cot. A glance around the hazy room restored his reality. No longer the 13-year-old boy from Illinois who lost his parents in a house fire, his clouded thoughts began to clear. He was just three months shy of 17. For the past three nights, he and his guardian, Jim Savage, along with Jim's clerks, had slept inside Savage's canvas-covered trading post in California's gold country. Last week, Jim's Yokut Indian workers had warned of a rumored raid on the trading post by Yosemite Indians. Grab your rifle, Jim yelled from across the room. The Yosemites are attacking. Early morning rays bled through the edges of the canvas doorway. Two of Jim's Indian wives, Homuk and Ikino, scuttled across the trading post's dirt floor. The women used their blankets to smother fires started by flaming tree limbs the Yosemites had thrown into the trading post. The shill cry of attacking braves iced his blood. Dressed in his long underwear, he stopped only to put on his trousers and old boots. He then thumbed up his suspenders, grabbed his rifle, and rushed out to join the others. Pops of gunfire echoed through the forest. Loin-clothed Indians slunk into the surrounding woods. An agonized scream erupted behind him. He turned to see Banyan, one of Jim's store clerks, tug at the shaft of an arrow that pierced his shoulder. Greeley, Jim shouted to another clerk. Stay at the post. Take care of Banyan. Watch for Indians that might double back. The rest of you follow me. Jim waved everyone forward. Movement between several tightly clustered oaks and pines caught their attention. Jim raised his rifle and fired. Branches swayed, leaves bent, but no Indian fell. Following Jim's signal, two clerks moved off to the right. The rest of them slowly fanned left. Just ahead, a shrub shuddered. Daniel held his breath, raised his rifle, and crept forward. A family of quail burst from the bush and ran to the safety of another. He slowly exhaled. Over here, Jim called out. He quickly ran to his side. His guardian had his rifle trained on an Indian girl hiding in the underbrush beneath two ponderosa pines. Get up, Jim barked, waving his rifle barrel a little higher. A girl with dark brown hair peeked out from behind a bush. She gave Jim a stony stare, but stayed behind the shrub. Jim shouted again, this time in a Yokut dialect. The girl did not respond. She doesn't understand you, came a soft voice next to Daniel. She's a Yosemite. He turned and saw the petite frame of Limick, a cousin of Jim's wife, Homut, standing beside him. Limick said something to the Yosemite girl. The girl yelled back, from behind a bush. What did she say? Jim asked. Daniel's eyebrows rose. Surprised, Jim didn't know the Yosemite language. Even though Jim couldn't read or write, he'd learned all the Indian dialects in the surrounding areas. Limick frowned and pulled her blanket more firmly around her shoulders. She says she's the granddaughter of Chief Tanaya, leader of the fierce Yosemite. She refuses to take orders from any white man. Jim's jaw clenched. Tell her that I'll shoot her in the leg if she doesn't come out from behind that bush right now. Limick translated Jim's order, but the girl stayed put. Loud shrieks rose from deeper in the woods. I don't have time for this, Jim growled. Daniel, keep your eye on this squaw. Shoot her if she tries to run. If she's Chief Tanaya's granddaughter, perhaps we can use her as a bargaining chip and get the Yosemites to stay out of Big Oak Flat. I need to see if my men spotted any other renegades, but... I'll be back as soon as I can. The girl behind the bush shouted more unintelligible words. Jim cocked his head to the side and studied Limick. She says her name is Tatuya, Limick translated. She says she will come out now to prove she is not afraid of the white man. Tatuya emerged from the bush. Seeing her dressed only in a buckskin shirt, Daniel quickly turned his head away. Jim laughed. Well, Daniel, with your Christian upbringing, I can see that you might have a hard time obeying my order to keep an eye on this Yosemite Sprite. Jim pulled his dingy white shirt over his head of long blonde hair and tossed it at the girl. 
Maybe it'll be easier to keep an eye on her if she's wearing more clothes. I forgot, you're not used to seeing these Indians in their native apparel. More shouts rang out. Jim peered into the forest. A second later, swift as a mountain lion, his muscled body sprang off in pursuit of his prey. Daniel pointed his rifle at the girl, but avoided any concentrated stare. He guessed she was close to Limick's age, possibly 15 or 16. Limick pantomimed instructions for Tatuya, demonstrating how she should put on the shirt. After Tatuya thrust her arms through the shirt's sleeves and readjusted her long braid down her back, she raised a defiant dirt-smudged chin at him. It's okay, he said. You can sit now. He waved his rifle barrel down. Lemick translated his words. Tatuya's eyes narrowed. She placed her hands on her hips and remained standing. He returned her glare, lunged forward, and aimed his rifle at her head. She sat beneath the tall pine. Keeping his rifle on the Yosemite, he glanced at Limick. Did you and the others put out the fire inside the trading post? Limick nodded. Yes, the women are fixing a meal right now. Do you want me to bring you something? I'd rather you stay here with me in case I need you to translate for... What did you say her name was? Tatuya, Limick said. Do you really think she is the Yosemite chief's granddaughter? He shrugged. Tatuya rubbed one of her ankles beneath the buckskin shirt. With his rifle still trained on her, he stepped closer. Her ankle appeared swollen. No wonder he and Jim had stumbled upon her while chasing away the Yosemites. She must have twisted it when she tried to flee. Limick spoke again with Tatuya. The young girl shook her head and continued to rub her ankle. Sweat dripped into his eyes, making them sting. He cradled his rifle barrel in his right hand and pinched the rifle's butt between his right side and upper arm. Freeing up his left arm, he dragged his long underwear sleeve across his forehead. It was early in the morning, but the mid-April sun had already warmed the pine-scented air. Limick spoke once more. Again, the girl shook her head. What did you say? He readjusted his grip on the rifle. I told her you are a good white man and that you won't hurt her if she does what you ask. I do not think she believes me. How did you learn the Yosemite language? Limick opened her mouth to speak, but before she said anything, he added, And come to think of it, how did you learn to speak English so well? The corners of Limick's mouth turned slightly upward. To answer both questions, I must start at the beginning. Are you sure you want to hear this story? Heat rose in his chest, embarrassed that he didn't know anything about Limick, even though she often prepared his meals and did his laundry. He watched as Tatuya continued to rub her ankle. Seems like we're stuck here on guard duty for a while, so sure, start at the beginning. Limick nodded. When I was five, my parents and my brother died from the illness you call smallpox. It killed almost everyone in our village, except for a few old women and some young children. That's awful, he frowned. What did you do? I was alone and hungry and didn't know what to do. I left to search for my cousin's village. And you were only five? She nodded. Yosemite's found me, and I lived with them for four years. One day, while picking berries, white miners kidnapped me and two other girls. They made us cook and do their laundry. When they found gold, they made us sift the river's sand to find nuggets or flakes. I'm sorry. He kicked the pine needles near his feet. It didn't sound much different than what Limick now did for him. She looked up at him. It turned out well in the end when I discovered that some men from my cousin's village were helping another white man known as El Rey Huero search for gold. I ran away from my kidnappers and fled to this man's camp. That's when I discovered that my cousin Homet was one of El Rey's wives. He shook his head and continued to keep an eye on Tatuya. El Rey Huero, indeed. To the Yokut Indians, Jim might be the blonde king, but he was certainly not royalty to him. Jim once told him how he'd convinced the surrounding tribes that the Great Spirit had sent him to the Indians on a moonbeam. Jim had bought a galvanic battery from an Italian immigrant and hiding it beneath the skins of a grizzly cub, he summoned arcs and sparks from it 
after severely shocking one of the chief's sons who challenged him, no one ever contested his authority again. She lowered her head and hesitantly approached him. Are you sure you don't want me to bring you something to eat? His stomach rumbled, but he shook his head. No, I'd rather you stay here until Jim gets back. He continued to point his rifle at Tatuya, who now stared off into the woods. I think El Rey is wise to keep the Yosemite girl. Limick lifted her small frame onto the rock and sat. You know that Yosemites do not call themselves by this name. It is a name that the surrounding tribes gave them. Then what do they call themselves? Limick studied Tatuya for a moment before she answered. They call themselves the Awanichi. As if responding to the familiar name, Tatuya raised her head. Limick continued. Awanichi means those who dwell in the gaping mouth. They call themselves this because it is said they live in a beautiful wide valley. No one but the Awanichi knows its location. If their name is Awanichi, why does everyone call them the Yosemite? The name Yosemite means those who kill, she explained. The Yosemites are the most feared tribe in the area. They'd sooner kill you than talk to you. Well, if they'd rather kill than talk, maybe we should let Tatuya go. Limick's mouth dropped. And disobey El Rey Huero? No, this is not a good idea. He kicked the twigs beneath his feet. Jim's not a king, he's just a man. Her face pinched together as if in thought. If it is not too impolite, may I ask a question? He raised the butt of his M1819 Hall rifle in his lap kept a finger on the trigger, and cupped his other hand around the gun's barrel. He shrugged. Sure. Limick studied Tutuya as she spoke. How did you come to work with El Rey? Are you... She hesitated. Are you El Rey's son by a white woman? He wasn't sure how to answer. He didn't want to talk about his parents' mysterious death in a house fire or about Hannah's death after a Paiute Indian attack. No, I'm not Jim's son, he finally told her. He didn't know what else to say. Tatuya shifted her position on the ground. When she glanced up, her gaze met his. Her dark eyes flashed with contempt. She then lowered her head, tucked her legs beneath her skirt, put a hand behind her back, and leaned against the tree. Daniel rolled his shoulders, but the tight muscles would not relax. Hopefully the raid would end soon and they could all get some breakfast. Twigs crackled from the girl's direction. His gaze shifted back to her. She whipped out a knife and pulled back her arm. He lunged forward. The tip of his rifle knocked the knife out of her hand. Limick ran forward and retrieved it. See, I told you that Yosemites would sooner kill you than talk to you. He pointed his rifle at Tatuya again, willing his racing pulse to slow. The girl returned to rubbing her ankle. If she really intended to kill me, he paused to catch his breath, I... Think I'd already be dead. She just looks like a scared young girl. After several deep breaths, his heartbeat returned to normal. Lowering his rifle, he studied the girl. Go. Tatuya looked up. Her dark eyes met his. Go now before the others come back. When Tatuya didn't move, he turned to Limick. Tell her she's free to go. I won't stop her. Limick grabbed his arm. No, you must not do this. El Rey said we should keep her here. We must do as he says. Remember how you felt when the white gold diggers kidnapped you? He nodded his head toward Tatuya. She probably feels the same way right now. Tell her she's free to go. That will earn us more goodwill with the Yosemites than kidnapping her. Limick studied the knife in her hand. Seconds later, in one swift movement, she slashed his arm. He howled and dropped his rifle. What did you do that for? With his other hand, he squeezed his bleeding gash. She cut off a strip of cloth from the bottom of her skirt and shouted something at Tatuya. The young Indian jumped up on one foot and limped into the woods. A minute later, Jim and two of his store clerks appeared in the clearing. Jim glanced around. Where's the squaw? I let her go, Daniel said. Jim's jaw dropped. You did what? Limick finished tying the strip of cloth around his wound. The girl sliced Daniel with a knife she had hidden in her skirt. 
She ran away before he could catch her. I, I am glad I was here to stop the bleeding. Jim stepped closer to him, crunching twigs and dry pine needles beneath his feet. I told you to keep an eye on her, boy. Jim grabbed his chin, forcing him to look up into his piercing blue eyes. I can't believe she got the drop on you. Like I've told you before, your own survival comes first in this wild, godforsaken country. Jim's pitch raised. I'm your legal guardian until you're 18, but I can't keep you safe if you don't do as I say. You got that? Yes, sir. He lowered his head and studied the ground. Maybe I shouldn't have let her go. Their own survival did need to come first. On that point, Jim was right. But he didn't have to like it. (laughs) ¶¶